1919, the U.S. adopted the 18th Amendment, which said, quote, the manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all the territory subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. This was a large-scale effort for prohibition or the temperance movement. And uh, they had been pushing really, really hard, not for uh, some kind of middle ground, but absolute prohibition, where they would get rid of all alcohol. And they, they made posters like this, and this is a really interesting poster. It's got kind of the steps of from, from first class to death. First step is a glass with a friend. Step two, a glass uh, to keep the cold uh, to keep the cold out. Step three, a glass too much. Step four, drunk and riotous. So here he is, kind of getting in fights with people. Step five, and I'm sorry, but my I, I cannot see very well. Um, The summit attained jolly companions, a confirmed drunkard. And it shows him having, having fun with his friends, but then we start going down the steps. Step six is poverty and disease. Step seven is forsaken by your friends. Step eight, and he looks pretty rough at this point, is desperation and crime. And step nine is death by suicide. It has a picture of him shooting himself in the head. So this, these were kind of the posters that were out there promoting prohibition and how, how uh, it just kind of showed the progress of drink. And um, it's an interesting thing to think about and to read up on, because now we, of course, of course, in the 21st Amendment, the 18th Amendment was appealed, and now alcohol is for sale again in the United States. And, and so it's kind of looked at as this failed experiment. But um, what, what is not often understood is how bad a problem alcohol was in the early 20th, in the early 20th century. It, it was uh, a real, it was a real problem, especially among young men in America, where they were shirking all of their duties. They were leaving their wives and children behind. In fact, I'll talk about this later, but that was one of the first way feminism uh, came from this idea that men were shirking their duties because they were drunk all the time. And so more than just this being about a bunch of uptight Christians uh, trying to you know, legislate morality, this was really something in America's history to try to turn around a cultural shift and something that had severe detriment to the whole of society. And so, uh, again, when people say, oh, you know, that, look what happens when Christians try to uh, run things and try to promote their own ideas in, in legislation, I, I think it actually, uh, people do not drink now as much as they did back then. Uh, they spent five more times on alcohol in 1900 than they did on public education. Can you imagine if we spent that much, uh, all that we spend on public education, if we spent five times that on alcohol? So it was a real problem, and really it was what saved America, I have to say. Uh, and again, it was repealed after a while, but that level of, of drinking alcohol hasn't come to America since. One of the uh, reasons for the promotion of the Prohibition Movement and the Temperance Movement was um, a man named Billy Sunday. Now, Billy Sunday had been a professional baseball player for the Chicago White Stockings and got saved at the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, of all places. And uh, he went around preaching against alcohol. He preached one message, hard against drinking. This is what he said in his message. The saloon is the sum of all villainies. It is worse than war or pestilence. It is the crime of crimes. It is the patent of cr parent of crimes and the mother of sins. It is the appalling source of misery and crime in the land. And to license such an incarnate fiend of hell is the dirtiest, low-down, damnable business on top of this old earth. There is nothing to be compared to it. So if, if, if it wasn't clear, he was very much against alcohol. And it was that kind of preaching that really brought about prohibition. So now, was he talking in his culture? Or was he talking, was what he was saying, does that, could you, could you put Billy Sunday in, in our 
era, in 12th century, in 1st century, and would his message be applicable for everybody? Is, is alcohol something that Christians should absolutely stay away from? How should Christians think about that? Now, here's the problem. If it's okay to drink, and we say it's not, we're taking away Christian liberty. We're being legalistic and pharisaical. But if it's not okay, and we say that it is, we're granting something that is sinful and potentially harmful, even from a secular standpoint. It's not something that Christians should be neutral on, even though there are some gray areas and some things that are not quite, we're not quite sure exactly uh, where to land on some of the peripheral issues. We're going to look at alcohol and what the Bible says about it. We looked in part one about the admonition, the clear, I think, clear admonition to avoid drunkenness. I talked to somebody this week uh, who uh, is a professing uh, Christian. I don't know people's hearts, of course, but they said, uh, uh, well, you know, we're not sure about alcohol, but drunkenness is definitely something that is prohibited in Scripture, and I think that's right, that drunkenness is, is something that the Bible says is a sin. Uh, most people, I think, admit that, and one of the problems with drunkenness is that you lose control of your faculties, and, uh, and, and you lose that, we talked about this, the filter, the thing where the, the Holy Spirit could speak to you and prevent you from doing things is largely gone when you are drunk. And so we're commanded to not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but to instead be filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. And so uh, we looked at that first. Part two then, last week, we looked at the examination of alcohol as a beverage in the Bible. And we said that many or even most people in the Bible drank beverages with some alcoholic content. It was not all mere grape juice that there was some, probably some amount of alcohol. The question, of course, is how much? Was it like kombucha? That's just maybe got a little bit. You, it's not, I mean, you'd have to drink gallons and gallons and gallons of it to get drunk. Or was it like the wine that you can go to the grocery store or uh, I don't know where you, I guess I don't know where you buy wine. Do you have to buy it from a liquor store or can you buy it from the grocery store? I don't know. There's, in Minnesota, they have all these things where you can buy some things in, uh, in, in like Walmart or in gas stations, but then other things you have to actually like go outside the gas station and come in another door and I don't know all. I don't know all the laws, and honestly, I don't care. But just for illustration, which one is it? You know, I, is that because when we think, because what people do is they say, "Well, Jesus drank wine, so it's okay for me to go get a forty and down it." And it's like, well, are those two things the same thing? I I argued last week that no, they were not the same thing. That uh, alcohol has some purposes, uh, like we talked about in Sunday school this morning. If you have a cold and you need something that has some alcoholic content, it's appropriate for you to take a teaspoon of something. Again, not, not to get drunk, not to give you any kind of effect at all, except the effect of what alcohol might do for your system. And uh, so it's important to keep that in perspective. Um, if uh, we also understand that some people, when you say, well, it's okay to use alcohol as a medicine, would try to drown their sorrows with alcohol, and that would not be the appropriate response um, to alcohol either. So but in part three, we're going to look at alcohol in the context of Christianity. There have been over the years three major views of, of Christians on this. And the first one is moderation or temperance. Uh, it's fine to have alcohol as long as it's in moderation, as long as you can balance it, as long as it's not too much. So social drinking, if, you have, if you're out with friends and you have a glass of wine, nothing wrong with that. If you, it's a hot day and you want to have a couple beers, that's fine. Uh, so just it, it's okay as long as you're using it in moderation. They'll, they'll admit that drunkenness is wrong, but they'll say alcohol consumption is okay. And they'll say that just because some people abuse alcohol shouldn't stop everybody from drinking it. Drinking is ex never expressly prohibited, so it is okay to do, and that is true. There's not a verse in the Bible that says never, ever, ever have anything with any alcoholic content in it. That is true. Uh, again, we said this last week, but that most people, when they drank something, had some kind of alcoholic content. The question is what and how much, and before you just go out and say, I'm going to go drink whatever I want, you should probably understand what you are actually 
grappling with when it comes to the, the fact that in the Bible, when they were talking about wine, they were not talking about the same kind of wine. Again, so that would be the, the first position. And, I, and to that, to the position of moderation, I would say, yes, but there are many passages, and we'll look at many of these tonight, that describe warnings against alcohol. So not just don't get drunk, but th- th- there are warnings against the use of alcohol. So maybe it's not expressly forbidden, but if something's warned against, right? Like, so you go into the, uh, into the uh, utility room back there, and there's the panel, right? And, uh, and there's warnings everywhere. You know, don't, don't, you'll get shocked if you, if you touch this in, in the wrong way, if you mess with it in the wrong way. Does that mean that those boxes are expressly forbidden? You know, that, why, I can't stick a screwdriver in here? Well, if they're warning you, then you probably shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, it's there, and it's good for, to have it in there, but, you, you know, it, it, if there's warnings, then, I mean, there's a danger there. So if the Bible's warning us about alcohol, it, it would behoove us to, um, to be careful about that. And if you, you know how it goes, don't you? If you tell people, if I tell Christians, it's okay for you to have one alcoholic drink a year. Well, where, where do I get... Where, where, biblically, where do I get the right to say just one? Why not one a month? Why not one a week? You know, I don't know what it's going to be, but just pick a, pick one drink, drink, and that's what you get for the week. Why not one a day? Why not one an hour? I mean, if it goes out of your system. See, you, see, see what I'm saying? If the Bible doesn't say it, the Bible doesn't say you can't, you have to ask, well, does the Bible say I should? And I think all the warnings in Scripture would tell us, no, you shouldn't. And that's The second position is, Abstentism. They say, though it's not prohibited, it's not the wisest choice. Uh, you should not use um, the Bible to justify um, your. Uh, you, you should you should not use alcohol to enjoy, to chase after drink. You should not use the Bible to to say it's okay to go after everything. So they say, well, it's not expressly forbidden in the Bible, but. Um, but it's not the wisest thing. It's not the best use of your money and time to drink alcohol. And the third position is a strict prohibition to say no alcohol is permitted. And again, the extreme position would be that it, it, it was always grape juice and that's all it was. And anytime people were drinking, it was just grape juice. Now, there are various good men throughout the ages that have taken all three positions. Uh, You look in history, you look at the early church fathers, you look at people that you respect and I respect, and they're on all sides of the spectrum. And I I would have to say that someone like Billy Sunday needed to be able to say what he did in a culture where there was so much drinking, even if he was maybe a moderation person. Uh, Obviously, he wasn't, but it was wise for him to do that. So what's my position on this? I would take... On the spectrum, I would take a strong abstentism, a weak prohibition. I'm not ready to say that anything that they drank was just grape juice, but it was more like grape juice than it was what we have today, wine. I don't think they were getting drunk all the time. I think people in biblical times, I think the people that we're looking at um, were used to something that was a grape drink that had alcoholic content, but so little that it did not have an effect on them. Now, can I prove that? No, I can't prove that from history. Uh, I can prove it better from history than I can from biblical admonition, but the Bible just took for granted that people were having this drink that they called wine, and all that wine, the word wine, we talked about this last week, meant product from the grape. It's hard to see a good reason for alcohol, but I can't convince you that if uh, a year ago on a hot summer day you had one beer, that that act in and of itself uh, was necessarily sinful. I think, I think it was, but I probably wouldn't be able to convince you from Scripture. But I can give you reasons from Scripture why you should not drink alcohol, besides the express command. Because if we say, nope, hey, if God says do it, then you're going to do it. And if he says don't do it then, it, then that's all I'm looking for. And if God never says don't do it, then it's okay for me to do. Okay, if you take just that principle, then it's going to be very hard to convince you. But if you take the total of Scripture and say, well, what do we do about this thing that there's some ambiguity about in the realm of uh, 
again, I'm not trying to, in the, it's an ambiguity in the realm of uh, what do we do about it? Looking at us compared to people in the Bible, how do we apply those things to our lives? So let me give you, this is not the beginning of my message, but it just feels like it, okay? Let me give you five reasons why you as a Christian should not drink. And in fact, I'll even give them to you right away, and then we'll go through them. Um, so that once I say all five, you can just leave if you'd like, because um, you now know all five. You know, I could keep you in suspense, but I could write it down. That way you can write it down in your notes if you're taking notes. Reason number one, modern day alcohol is not healthy for you. It's not good for you. It's not good for your health. Number two, alcohol has addictive properties. Number three, an unsaved world expects Christians to stay away from alcohol. Number four, the overall tenor of intoxicating beverages is negative in scripture. And number five, we make um, to stumble some who would struggle with alcohol. Now, those are my five reasons why Christians should not. Number one, modern day alcohol is not healthy for you. So let me give you some information. Uh, just beer is, we looked at this a little bit, and again, I don't know a lot about this, but beer is basically uh, some kind of Wheat product, I know it's hops and other things, but it's basically a, a bread in a bottle. It's, uh, it, they take this wheat germ and they ferment it, and uh, it's full of carbs. If you see anybody that drinks a lot of beer, they have a beer belly. All those carbs go right to their, right to their stomach. Um, so it's, it's full of carbs, and carbs aren't good for you. Alcohol can, uh, use can rewire your brain. Uh, there's a lot of science out, out there that talks about how uh, it actually changes the way that you think over time, uh, especially if you start very young drinking. Uh, it can it can really change the way that you that you that you think, and it can really they are even doing some uh, work in what causes al Alzheimer's. And and part of the research again it's preliminary in a way, but part of the research that they're looking at is is if there's a connection with drinking in your 20s and 30s with Alzheimer's in your 50s and 60s, even if you stop. In your, in your 40s and 50s. And so that's an important part of that. Uh, it can affect your liver as your liver tries to filter things, as it, your liver tries to work. Uh, if the liver is kind of the one that we hear about besides the brain that uh, is most affected by alcohol. Uh, it can make your pancreas create toxin, which literally can kill yourself. Um, it can cause cancer, head cancer, neck cancer, uh, larynx cancer, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, breast cancer, and many, many others has been, have been linked to the use of alcohol. In 2019, 2.4 million deaths were ascribed to alcohol. Um, of course, we're not counting injuries after people have had a little bit. So that's just, that's just um, we're talking about injuries in the body, but uh, there's also... Again, if you look at Proverbs 23, verse 29 says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contention, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes. It talks about the physiological way that alcohol affects us. Verse 35, They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And the idea there, again, is that, that you have injuries. Where did this come from? I got beat up last night. I have no idea what happened. Uh, I, I mouthed off, and somebody beat me up, and I have no recollection at all. Uh, alcohol has an effect on you. It, it is not good for you. No, I can hear objections to this admonition. One is... Well, I've heard that alcohol is good for you. I heard that red wine is good for you. Well, let me say this. What's beneficial in red wine are the antioxidants. Question, is red wine the only source of antioxidants? No. There's a lot of different foods that have antioxidants in them that are, that are good for you. Um, and two, these studies have largely been debunked. These studies were, uh, had, had faulty, uh, faulty basis. They're... Uh, sample size was way too small, and uh, some people just took this and ran with it. Most of the studies were funded by the alcohol industry, and so, of course, they're going to come up with the fact that red wine is good for you. Now, nobody says vodka is good for you. Nobody says, nobody says um, uh, the hard liquors are good for you. Nobody really says beer is good for you. 
Uh, red wine is the one that they hold out there. Red wine is good for you. And again, that's just been proven false. Objection number two is, well, what about other unhealthy things? Okay, you say we shouldn't do this because it's not healthy for us. But uh, you know, you notice they still sell Pop Tarts and Twinkies and and uh, Hot Pockets and uh, you know, Pastor, come on, no, uh, you know they they sell all kinds of things like that at Walmart. And I, you know, I'm sure when we have a fellowship next Sunday, there's going to be probably some unhealthy things on the table. What about what about those things? Well, I would say that there are many unhealthy things that we eat that we should avoid. Now, I won't argue with you there, right? There there are things that we shouldn't eat um, that are. Uh, that too much of it is going to be bad for us. But I will say that fast food at least has some nutrition to it, right? It's not prolonged use, and a lot of it is not good for you, but it has some nutritional value. You can go get a a hamburger from McDonald's, and uh, it won't have the same effect as going to get a beer uh, every day. You have a hamburger every day from McDonald's or a beer every day, and uh, the hamburger is going to be vastly better for you, okay? Now, again, we all understand sugar is not good for you, and we all as a society have way too much sugar, and sugar is a key factor in a lot of, uh, of comorbidity, right? People are would be much healthier if they worked out and exercised and ate a lot less sugar and carbs. We all, I think, understand that, and we as Christians should be taking a charge on that. But this whataboutism when it comes to alcohol uh, is, not, is also not very helpful because, okay, uh, the Bible says there are things that are, that are unhealthy. I, I'm making the case that alcohol is not healthy for you. There's no actual nutritional value in it. It's empty. And, and the same thing I can say for, for the candy that we just passed out, right? There are some, some things in there that just, like, they're empty calories. And um, we ought to just be careful about that. But there's not the danger of that as much with, with alcohol. Um, the benefits of alcohol are all social. That my friends are drinking, so I drink. Uh, if there's any benefits at all, that would be it, not a health benefit. It's not healthy for us. That's number one. Number two, alcohol has addictive properties. Notice at the end of verse number 35, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. That idea of seeking after it, alcohol has addictive properties. Now, give me some some thoughts um, about this. It stimulates a part of the brain, and people enjoy that high that they get when uh, when it's in, when that part of their brain is engaged with alcohol. There are some studies that suggest that it may that some people may be genetically predisposed to drink, and um, I, I don't know if I'm one of those people. There, there, my uh, my parents never drank. Um, as far as I know, my grandparents never drank. I'm not saying that they didn't probably have something to drink at some point in their life, but they, there wasn't that quote-unquote alcoholism. And I, I use that term really carefully because, uh, I try to anyway, because alcoholism makes it sound like it's a disease and not a series of choices. Um, but understand that if it's true, and again, it's hard to say, but if it's true that some people are genetically predisposed to alcohol addiction in some way, then uh, it would be it would be very it would be sad to find that out at some point. For me, like if I I don't know if I had a drink of alcohol of some kind, if all if I would be so like that, I need this in my life to the point where I would then become uh, addicted to it, where it would be a pattern in my own life. And, um, and you don't know that either. You don't know wh- how, what the reaction might be to that, to that alcohol. It might be something that sticks with you, and it is a very hard habit to kick. And, uh, and, and again, because it's not the same thing as having a cinnamon roll. It's not the same thing as, as uh, some of the foods. I mean, I, I love cinnamon rolls. They're great. But I, I'm not addicted to it. I'm, I'm not breaking into people's houses to buy money for cinnamon rolls. It's, it's just not the same thing. There's something, ab- there's something about the addictive nature of alcohol. Now, you say, well, but there are other addictive things. And again, I will say, yes, we should have mastery over those things as well. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached unto others, I myself should be a castaway. But alcohol is addictive and dangerous, whereas others are not. Uh, caffeine can be addictive. Um, I, after talking about this uh, two weeks ago or, or last week, I don't remember, 
Um, I think it, was, it must have been two weeks ago, but I, I thought, you know, I have been probably drinking too much caffeine, and so I, I quit. And uh, I, I had a, a headache for a couple days, for a day and a half. Now, was it stress-induced? There was a lot going on, and it might have been that. I don't know, but I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to have a headache just because I gave up caffeine, then I don't need this to be a part of my life. I don't, I don't need to rely on this. I don't want this to be a crutch. Now, that was a choice that I made. Um, now, here's the thing. It was just a headache. I, I have a, a, a friend who is trying to quit drinking and, again, according to him, can't because his body will go into shock. He'll, his body will actually start to uh, shut down if he doesn't have it. And uh, you, you've heard the same thing with people that are on heroin or whatever. They actually have stocked heroin at the hospital so that they can give you some to wean you off of it because, it, you, because otherwise you will die. Can I say that I don't ever want to become so dependent on anything that it's keeping me alive, um, caffeine or otherwise? And so we as Christians, it, it does behoove us to not be beholden to any kind of food or drink. Again, we need food and we need drink. But, the, but certain kinds of things. And so I'll, I'll even admit that. But again, caffeine does not do long-term damage. And to quit, I might get a headache, but that's going to be it. I, I might get a little, I have a few little things like that, but it's not like alcohol. They're on different planes. And again, I think it's, I think it's prudent for Christians to not be beholden to anything. But it's also uh, not the same thing. And so it's important for us to look at that. Uh, if you drink, you may find that you cannot stop. And verse 32 says, At last, at the last, it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. And that idea is again that someone playing, the picture is someone playing with a snake that suddenly turns around and bites it. Uh, I've heard testimony after testimony, and you can say anecdotal evidence doesn't matter, but it absolutely does. Testimony after testimony of people that say, I just had, you know, it was one drink, and that was all it took for me to get totally, totally hooked. It, it's a drug. It is, it is the drug of choice of many Americans, and uh, that addictive property is a real problem, and a reason that Christians who are going to be uh, under the control of the Holy Spirit, don't need something else controlling our life. Even if you never get drunk, but it's a part of your life and you find yourself needing it, uh, that is a problem. Number three, an unsaved world expects Christians to stay away from alcohol. Now, I say that, and I know that there are objections to this already because you know people, but let me just hear me out, okay? Okay. Um, this becoming less and less so. I uh, had a friend who uh, had a kind of a wake for a relative who had passed, and uh, it wasn't. It was at a restaurant in the area, and so I went to support him and to show my support. And uh, he offered me a beer. Knows I'm a pastor. Knows I'm a chaplain, and offered me a beer. And I thought he was joking at first, and uh, and then I was like, oh no no, I said, sorry, I, I don't drink. He's like, oh, really? And he was surprised that I don't drink. I'm, I guess we're not that good of friends, um, if he didn't know that. But So it's becoming less and less so that people would be surprised. Oh, you're a Christian and you drink um, in America. Um, but I would say that it is pretty clearly not compatible with a Christian message. Now, again, people say, well, I know it's not right to get drunk. Now, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about Christians should never get drunk. That we've already established. I'm saying that there, there is this, there is something that goes along with alcohol. It's the society and the circle part of drinking. And one of the reasons, one of the main reasons that people give why they drink is the social. And so who drinks? Well, people that are in the crowd. Now, again, you have people that drink alone. I understand all that. And they're trying to, maybe they have a real problem or maybe they have, but I'm saying one of the major reasons for people drinking is that social aspect. And there's a crowd. So who is this crowd? It's not just often about sitting around and drinking. It's about partying. And crowds tend to influence us. And so um, in scripture, drunkenness has, or alcohol has, Rowdy cousins. It's not just about drinking a drink, right? We can all talk about water. We can talk about grape juice. But when, we, when it comes to alcohol, there are things that accompany that. And scripture puts these cousins, these, these adjacent things with alcohol. 
uh, verse 33, thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Again, it's this idea that when you're in this setting and alcohol has kind of soaked into it, even if you're not drunk, you're going to say things that you wouldn't say. You're going to be, you're going to look at people um, in a different way. And there's, there's just the whole very idea of what we're here to do changes when there's alcohol involved. But let me give you a few things that talk about this. And again, um, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make it what it isn't. I just want to ask you, why are these things together? Romans 13, 13. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. He says, we as Christians, let us walk in these things. And he said, one of the, part of the things he mentions is rioting and drunk, drunkenness. And with drunkenness is chambering, people living together. They're not married, and they're what we would say shacking up. Wantonness, lustfulness, not in strife and envying. What's the connection with alcohol and those things? Well, the Bible puts those connections there, and I think, again, anybody who's honest about the use of alcohol also puts those things often together. In Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, Variants, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you also in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now again, it mentions drunkenness and revelings, and with that, wrath, strife, heresies, idolatry, witchcraft, or we could say even drug use, um, fornication, all those things are associated with alcohol use. Luke 21, 34, Jesus said, Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Again, drunkenness and the cares of this life. Alcohol and the affairs of the world go together. There's a, there's a connection there. 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, back when we were saved, before we were saved, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Yeah, I'll well, see right there it says that they'll actually talk bad about me if I don't go with them. Yeah, they will, but not for the reason you're thinking. <laughs> When they say they speak evil of you, they're not saying you're being evil. They might say you're being a prude, and they might say you're being no fun. They might say you're being holier than thou, but uh, only because they expect that Christians are supposed to be different, that there's a separation there, that all the things that are with drink culture are not things that Christians ought to be known for. So whether they say it or not, I don't know what would have happened if, if, if he would have said, here, you want a beer? And I said, sure, and I drank it. I don't know if they'd be like, whoa, I didn't really expect you would. Or if they'd be like, okay. But again, if that's something that I'm known for, oh man, Josh, he's always a good time at a party. He never gets drunk because the Bible says no. But that, that's something, again, that Christians should not be known for. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics in 1996, 36% of crimes were committed by someone uh, under the influence of alcohol. Okay, that was 1996. And over a third of crimes had something to do with alcohol. And again, that just, it just goes together. Not just other Christians. Again, I'm not just talking about other Christians. I'll talk about that. That's my fifth point, uh, other Christians. But the world even makes a separation. One of the great missionary stories is about a man named John G. Patton. And if you ever uh, get a biography about John G. Patton, you'll be just astounded by the stories of his life. But he said this, from observation at an early age, I became convinced that mere temperance societies were a failure and that total abstinence by the grace of God was the only sure preventative as well as remedy. What was temperance in one man was drunkenness in another. And all the drunkards came not from those who practiced total abstinence, but from those who practiced or tried to practice temperance. I have seen temperance men drinking wine in the presence of others who drank to excess and never could see how they felt clear of blame. I had, and I had known ministers and others, once strong temperance advocates, fall through their moderation and become drunkards. 
Therefore, it is all my life appeared to me beyond dispute in reference to intoxication of every kind that the only rational temperance is total abstinence from them as beverages and the use of them only as drugs and then only with extreme caution as they are deceptive and deleterious poisons of the most debasing and demoralizing kind. I found also that when I tried to reclaim a drunkard or caution anyone as to intemperate habits, one of the first questions was, are you a pledged abstainer yourself? By being enabled to reply decidedly, yes, I am. The mouth of the objector was closed, and that gave me a hundredfold more influence with him than if I had had to confess that I was only temperate. For the good of others and for the increase of their personal influence as the servants of Christ, I would plead with every minister and missionary, every office bearer and every Sabbath school teacher, everyone who wishes to work for the Lord Jesus and the family, the church, and the world to be a total abstainer from all intoxicating drinks. Again, there is an association there. And uh, if you're someone who's known for alcohol, uh, that is going to ruin your testimony. Are you willing to give up something that others would associate with sin. Uh, Christian women, again, started temperance because their husbands were drinking their money away and they had no recourse. The husband would work and he would not bring the money home. He'd go drink it at the saloon and the women still had to take care of their kids. They couldn't go buy groceries and they said, I don't have any recourse. There's nothing I can do about this. I can't work and my husband's drinking all my money away. And so they started these these. Um, these uh, prohibition societies, they called it temperance, but again, it's not in the same way as uh, only a little bit. It was to get rid of it altogether. There was one woman, and I'm trying to remember her name, but uh, she would actually take an ax to saloons and start hacking it to pieces and was arrested over 30 times. And she called herself uh, Jesus's bulldog, that she would go and bark at whatever Jesus hated. Um, and again, what were the women supposed to do? Men were, who were supposed to be uh, leading and being an example were instead addicted to drink and throwing all their money away in drink. And, um, and uh, again, over and over again, we, we see in Scripture this association of alcohol with sinfulness. Number four, the overall tenor of intoxicating beverages is negative in Scripture. Okay, can I point to a verse that says, thou shalt not ever have any intoxicating thing? No. But what's the tenor of Scripture when it talks about alcohol? Yes, there are some that give positive perspective on wine. Often oil and wine is a sign of blessing. But again, the alcoholic content was not the same as alcohol in the way that we think, right? God was not saying, if you'll obey me, I will bless your liquor stores. He wasn't. He was saying, I will bless your vineyards and the oil and the wine, the product that comes out of this, the corn that comes out of your fields, that is what I will bless. I will bless. Now, whatever they did with that is a different thing. And again, I can talk about wine as not being the exact same thing as what we're talking about. Psalm 104, verse 15, wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face to shine and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Talking about the blessings of God. Yes, it's true. Ecclesiastes 10.19, a feast is made for laughter, and wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. Again, it says wine maketh merry, so there it is. Is that an admonition to drink? Well, you can balance that with these verses. Again, Proverbs 23, verse 29, who hath woe, who hath, contention, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? The answer, they that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, it stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or that lieth down upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. The Bible, the Bible prohibits it for those in leadership. In Leviticus 10, the priests were not allowed to drink wine. Proverbs 31, 4, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. It'll pervert their judgment. Pastors and deacons were not to be given to wine or much wine. And in general, alcohol is something that was Again, looked at negatively. Proverbs 20, verse 1, wine is a mocker, 
Strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Isaiah 5, verses 22 and 25, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. Isaiah 28, 7, But they also have erred through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Hosea 3, verse 1, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord, toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. Again, the association there with idolatry and wine. Hosea 4, 11, Whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Joel 3, verse 3, They have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Again, the, the in Scripture, the overall tenor about alcohol is not one of positive. It's not something that is, is encouraged. It is something that is overall negative. And reason number five, we're going to have to go to Romans chapter 14 for this. It's, it's an important point, I think, when we're considering this. <laughs> That's great. Number, point number five is we make to stumble some who will struggle with alcohol. Uh, we can say that it's very possible to find a Christian who can have one drink of some kind and it does not affect them. All right? I'm not granting that you should. I'm just granting that for argument's sake, you can say, yes, okay, here's a Christian who can have a drink and he's not getting drunk and, uh, and, and has a clean conscience. Verse 21, however, in Romans 14 would say this, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. You may in some ways somehow be permitted to do certain things, but instead should abstain. There are some who struggle, and it may cause them to stumble in their faith. It may be that there are some who have been delivered from the clutches of alcohol, and if you uh, indulge in that and promote it, you could cause them to stumble, just like John G. Patton said. We have an obligation to them to show them Christian love and abstain from alcohol. Verse 13, notice it says, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. If you're going to judge something, don't be like, what's wrong with them? Why can't they just get over it? Don't judge somebody else, but judge rather this, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. One of those things can be this issue of alcohol, that people say it's perfectly fine to do it, and they convince someone who it's not perfectly fine for them to do that because they will fall. Now, somebody might ask, well, do, so do I have to live my whole life? At the convictions of other people? You know, what, what do I go around in church and be like, well, how do you think I should live my life? How do you think I should live my life? Well, in some ways, no, you can't do that. You can't live because others don't like what we're doing. Um, some people say you should never go to any place that even serves alcohol. Well, that's going to be a pretty hard thing to do. Uh, most gas stations do. Most grocery stores do. Um, Pizza Hut does. Um, um, most restaurants, so that's a, that's a pretty hard thing to do, but that is perfectly fine, and, and uh, so you can't just live on someone else's conviction because of that. Um, it's, it's not worth nothing, but it's not worth altering your whole life. So no, you're not obligated to, talk, to just live by other people's convictions. However, we're not talking about other people's preferences and convictions. We are talking about the obligation to others. Notice in verse number 7, None of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. Uh, part of being a church, part of being a community means that you're not an island, that you have an attachment to others, that there are people that are watching you. And you can be like Charles Barkley in the 90s who said, I don't want to be a role model, but you are. You have other people in the church that are looking to you and that are look, they're looking for help and how they should live their life. And if you are intemperate and, and not careful, you may teach someone to do something that will make them fall away. It's not about what people don't like, OK? 
Okay? I don't like that you wear that. You know, your, your coat was made in a sweatshop, and the Uyghurs made your coat, and so uh, that's not right. Well, I can't live by everybody's convictions. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about something that might actually cause someone to fall or stumble in their faith. That's a different thing. You can actually destroys, destroy someone else's faith with your insistence on your Christian liberty. To be someone who says, hey, listen, this is not a big deal. Uh, it's fine. You know, uh, you know, the Bible says that uh, wine cheers the heart, and so come on over and, and have wine in, our, in my house would be a sinful and destructive thing, and you'll answer to God for that. Look at verse number 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not then your good... You're trying to follow the Lord, and you maybe get it wrong. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, it's true, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, that's true. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify and not destroy others. For meat, destroy not the work of God that God's doing in someone else's heart. All things indeed are pure. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. I read an article uh, years ago, and I found it again just this afternoon from Christianity Today. Uh, D.L. Mayfield, a woman who wrote back in June 4th, 19, uh, 2014, she said this. So she was someone who, you, who grew up abstaining, and then felt like she could, and then moved into areas of low income and saw, started to see the effects of alcohol. And, uh, and then, so she felt like the pendulum was kind of swinging, and, and then she had a lot of Christian friends that were drinking a lot, and she said this, I see this evidenced in my own life. My peers, most of them traveling along upwardly mobile career paths, constantly reference alcohol, especially on social media, posting pictures of a frothy, dark Guinness, tweeting about needing a glass of wine after a long day with a toddler, hosting a birthday party in a hipster whiskey bar. Churches are hosting small groups like Think and Drink, talking theology over craft beer. And with every picture, tweet, and event that centers on alcohol, I wonder, is any, isn't anyone friends with alcoholics? What she's saying is, it, don't you have people in your life that, have alcohol, that, that are struggling in alcohol and you're just fine with doing this and, and promoting this? Is, is this something that Christians ought to be known for? It is worth giving up. It's not worth having. Again, my, my reasons, I'll give them to you again, for why a Christian should not drink alcohol is modern-day alcohol is not healthy for you. There's no health benefit at all. The benefits are all the way that you feel and the way that it's self-medication, and the Holy Spirit has something to say about the way that you uh, can loosen up the way that you can, uh, the Holy Spirit can give you all the things that you can get from alcohol, but without the opening yourself up to influence in a satanic way. Two, alcohol has addictive properties. And again, there's a lot to that. But I really, again, I really think that you're opening yourself up to satanic deception when you do that. Number three, an unsaved world in some way expects Christians to stay away from alcohol. Alcohol is something known uh, that, that lubes the world and keeps it going, and Christians ought to take, uh, put some distance between them and alcohol. Number four, the overall tenor of intoxicating beverages is negative in Scripture. It's not promoted. It may be, again, in some ways, somehow um, allowed, but there are other things in the Bible where Jesus said, oh, God allowed this because you had hard hearts. I don't want to be involved in something that was allowed because of hard hearts. I want to be, some, I want to be right where God calls me to. And then finally, we make to stumble some who will struggle with alcohol. Now, here you are considering this, and you're thinking, well, Josh, it would have been a lot easier for you just to say the Bible always says never, ever drink, and here's the verse that says that. And don't I wish there was a verse that said uh, you know, here you can have alcohol up to this proof, or you can get the legal uh, alcohol uh, blood limit of 0.01 and 0.02, and that's fine, and that's all. That's all you can do. And if you go above that, you're you're sinning. The Bible doesn't say that, so we are stuck to try to figure this out for ourselves. Can I give you? Can I modify a uh, thought experiment 
and uh, something put out by Blaise Pascal. Um, and, and what he used, it was called Pascal's Wager. And, and the idea was this. And, and after you've considered all of the, uh, so Bla Pascal was trying to prove the existence of God and uh, did a masterful job of it. But it came to the end and said, now maybe I've given you all this evidence and you're still not convinced that there is a God. You looked at all the evidence and it could go either way. Now again, he's not just saying, um, it's, not, it's not a manipulative way, but he's saying if, if you still can't figure out if God exists, then, then here's the, the wager. Um, if you uh, go into eternity, if you die and uh, you believe in God and you're wrong, what are you out? Well, nothing. And if you, uh, if you believe in God and you die and uh, you're right, what do you get? Well, you get everlasting life. And if you don't believe in God and you're right, what do you get? Well, nothing. Right? Or if, you, if you don't believe in God, hold on. If you don't believe in God and, and you're right, there is no God, then what do you get? Well, nothing. If you don't believe in God and you're wrong, what do you get? Well, hell forever. And he said, so, so again, this is in a manipulative way, but he says, if you really can't decide and you're really not sure and you feel like you need just a little more evidence, then, then here's he, we say what you could do. When you think about this wager and on one side, you get everlasting life. On the other side, you get everlasting destruction. destruction and in the middle is nothing. Then wouldn't it make sense to take that step of faith in the right direction? Can I... Um, to accept the Lord. Now, can I just change that a little bit? Okay, so here you are, and you're like, well, I don't know. Alcohol might be bad. So what if, what if alcohol is fine by God? And, uh, and, and you, uh, uh, what, what if alcohol is fine by God, and you decide that you don't partake of it? What do you, what do you get? Well, nothing. Uh, what if you're right? Do you get a reward for drinking alcohol? No, you don't. There's nothing there. What, what if alcohol is wrong, absolutely wrong, and, uh, and you abstain? What do you get? Well, you might get reward. You, you might get influence. You might get opportunity. What if alcohol is wrong and you say, well, it's, I'm just going to go ahead and take, I'm going to take this alcohol anyway, even though it's wrong. What do you get? Well, you lost opportunity, um, lost reward. I'm not saying it'll, you'll lose your salvation, but uh, there's, there's loss there. And so if you can't decide... Is it right or is it wrong? On one side, if God doesn't care, then you're not out anything by abstaining. But if God does care, then you're, you're actually getting a benefit by abstaining. And so to modify that a little bit, let me just encourage you to think through these things in a biblical way and uh, to make what I think the right choice. I could 